at the uh, panel that um, uh, began to, to experience the deficit. And maybe the government should adjust the fuel price much earlier than 2030. If the government raised the fuel price probably in 2010 or 2011, I believe that we are we were in the better state to anticipate the paper tantrum in 2030. Yeah. Um, a dependency on external financing, I mentioned about it. To overcome the paper tantrum, consistency and stability of the growth is very important. And this is very, I think this is the lesson here that's also important. Uh, it is very important to the same position between government and the central bank. Because if the government continue to ask the central bank to lower the interest rate, yeah, or to intervene in the central bank somehow to defend the exchange rate, then there will be inconsistency on policy. At that time, the good thing is the government was entirely support the central bank to let the exchange rate to depreciate and to raise the interest rate at that time. So this this cooperation is a very important one. Yeah. Exchange rate is important as shock absorber, but need clear and better information from both and central bank. Moving forward, the situation with the negative interest rate in Japan and Europe and the continued gradual normalization will allow capital inflow coming in into Indonesia, but don't forget, you know, the party will over. I don't know when. So we need to be careful to anticipate this. But the good thing is our current account deficit now is less than 2%. Yeah, the external balance is in a better shape. Our fiscal is in a better shape. So I think I'm more optimistic with the current situation. But the lesson learned from the 2013 table tantrum, it's probably a valuable thing to learn, both from India and Indonesia experience. Uh, I don't want to talk about the technical things. Yeah, but if you are interested to look at the relationship between the, let me just give some example of this uh, uh, result. This is the you know the result, the relationship between the impulse driven function between the budget surplus and the capital uh, capital current account is positive. So if you uh, increase the or reduce the budget deficit, that will improve the current account. If you look at the exchange rate, you see a sort of like evidence of the J curve, even for the interest rate. Yeah. So initially the current account deficit will deteriorate, then later on will improve. So it shows that back again that this expenditure switching and expenditure reducing policy actually work in reality. I stop it here. Thank you very much. Thank you, thank you. Uh, thank you. Thanks also for being on time. Thank my job being here. And uh, I believe uh, we already uh, heard about comprehensive and complete explanations on uh, 2013 paper tantrum. Uh, it's a very uh, well-rounded figures that we got in mind and as faculty brass nursery and academicians, I always use theoretical perspective to explain what has happened in the field. And but uh, I believe we can see another perspective to complete uh, what Dr. Kofi Basri explained about the 2013 uh, taper tantrum from the uh, prominent discussions and the like. Actually, the, the lecture, the teachers of the Dr. Kofi Basri. First, uh, I give the floor to uh, Professor Dr. Uh, Mari Pangestu uh, for 15 minutes uh, to give a comment and directly to Dr. Reza Siregat for another 15 minutes. After that, I will open question and answer session. Ibu Mari, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you, Kiki. Good afternoon, uh, friends, ladies and gentlemen. Glad to be here again at the Sadli lecture. Uh, and uh, always remember Pat Sadli, of course, uh, who was the eternal, eternal optimist, as uh, Kati Basri was just saying earlier. Uh, and he was a mentor, I guess, to many of us, or all of us. And you remember uh, his morning calls, right? <laughs> he would call us if there's an issue or something he's been thinking about. He'll call you around 6, 7 o'clock in the morning. And then we'll have a long conversation, and then uh, it will appear in the business news editorial uh, probably the next day. So he was um, someone who always was thinking about economics, and not just in the academic sense, but always in the policy sense. And he always liked a good debate, so I think he would have been, if he was here today, he would have enjoyed uh, our session. 
Now I have to have a difficult job to uh, comment on uh, Dede or Hati Basri's paper. Uh, it, it's an excellent paper and very comprehensive. Uh, and as a teacher, I think the best satisfaction for a teacher is when your student becomes better than you. <laughs> so uh, I, I really uh, highly appreciate uh, the work he's done. I mean, I have a few students, other students in the room here today, and all of you are, are better uh, than, than the teacher. Uh, and I think it's very rare you have someone with very strong academic background who was also the policy maker at the time when this 2013 taper tantrum was being made. So uh, I think we have had a very a good insight, uh, not just from the uh, academic analysis, but also from uh, the, the one who was uh, in, uh, intimately involved uh, with the policy making. So I would like to just perhaps ask a few uh, questions um, and to enrich the paper. Uh, and uh, probably my strength today is no longer uh, kind of questioning the academic side of it. I will let. Uh, Reza do that, I would like to uh, more uh, focus on the policy issues and the political economy issues. So uh, just a couple of questions on, on kind of the, the way we try to think about why uh, countries, some countries fared better uh, and some countries were um, more impacted by the uh, paper tantrum. Uh, and some of it is related to the precondition of the country. Uh, uh, like, uh, uh, you know, if you read a lot of the analysis on this, what happened during the paper tantrum, uh, you, you mentioned a few, like the currency appreciation, the exposure to resources, whether you're a commodity exporter or importer. But I just wanted to add maybe three more that you didn't really mention, which is mentioned in, in other uh, discussions about paper tantrum. One is the, the uh, precondition of a country of whether they, their ability to uh, have tighter capital controls, uh, in, in the sense that uh, you know, if you could have impose a kind of a Tobin tax or uh, any kind of policy that will uh, influence the type of capital inflow that comes into your country, uh, then you might have had less exposure to portfolio flows <coughs> compared to uh, the case. And I think the numbers actually show China had uh, more FDI than portfolio, but that's because China had Control. And then Mexico was also used, uh, the Latin American countries actually have uh, kind of almost the same amount of FDI and portfolio. The Asian countries were the one who had a huge amount of portfolio um, compared to FDI. And, and that is related to uh, their ability to uh, uh, use some kind of capital control mechanisms. And the question here is actually kind of a policy question too. I kind of recall, I don't remember exactly the dates, whether it was preceding the paper tantrum or it was right during it. I remember Bangi Indonesia tried, uh, they, they, they call it sand in the wheels or something like that, they tried to in, uh, introduce policies that will uh, influence the short term flows, whether uh, coming in or going out. But I recall that they didn't actually implement it. And it would be interesting to know whether it was, you know, I, I in, in the times that whenever we talk about uh, how to manage short-term capital flows, in the case of Indonesia, it's always because we are supposed to have bebas devisa. It's always as soon as you try to uh, do anything, people think, "Oh, we can't do it because uh, the law does not allow us to do or, you know bebas devisa." Or you you are afraid that this is people are going to interpret this as the beginning of capital control, and then you may actually uh, induce capital outflow. I don't know how much of that is still true, but that's just a question. The second precondition is your uh, is kind of a growth story. Uh, growth uh, and the prospect for growth is also a, a factor, I guess, in the paper tantrum story. And China, how much I, how much uh, China uh, slowed down in that time? Exposure of countries to China, like Indonesia. Is The, the case that was given as an example was Mexico. Mexico was less hard hit, even though because they had uh, they were able to switch because of the deficit and financial and foreign exchange market. So those are kind of just like questions. And I also had kind of a question: the whole issue about uh, what is high or low in terms of the current account deficit over GDP. Is that still an important question or not? Uh, I mean, you said that 
okay, maybe we don't have to worry about the, so a lot of people think we don't have to worry about the current account uh, deficit as a percentage of GDP. But obviously, uh, what, is it, what do you call them? Common, your common creditors, they do look at it. And in the, in the good old days, before the uh, Asian financial crisis, if I'm not mistaken, we used to use 5%, right? 5% uh, current account deficit over GDP was safe, and I think 20% of foreign debt over GDP was safe. Those are kind of rule of thumb before the Asian financial crisis. After the Asian financial crisis, people said, oh, you, you cut, it's more vulnerable, etc., etc." But what was the number? I mean, if, you, if I look at your table one, it seems that you're assuming it's 3%. Yeah. Is that 3% something that comes out of just the rule of thumb or uh, you know, common creditors? Uh, were, were we? I, I remember. Uh, I think it was you yourself uh, during that time. Said, we were being unfairly punished. Uh, it, you know, uh, it, yes, it was growing, but uh, were we unfairly punished uh, or not? I mean, that's just a question. Uh, what's the thinking uh, on on this? Okay, so that's kind of like uh, kind of questions on on the table tantrums. So I'd, I'd like to now uh, talk a little bit about policy responses and lessons learned. I think one one lesson learned. Uh, from, what, from what you were discussing, is the importance of policy coordination between ma uh, monetary and fiscal policy. You, you kind of had this story where, okay, you, the, the fiscal policy, maybe fuel subsidy was a bit late in coming, but then it came, so you had the expender switching and the expender reduction, but the monetary policy was perhaps late. Yeah? Uh, we always said that they were behind the curve in raising the interest rate compared to India, and that's why India fared better. So that's a question of the coordination between fiscal and monetary policy, uh, and that's lesson learned, I think. Uh, and then in, on, the, on the upside, I think we also uh, lowered our interest rate uh, slower than India. So again, um, and I also think in the economy question, uh, and, and that's another one of your favorite subjects. You didn't kind of touch on it at all uh, in this presentation. And uh, 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 one question I had was, uh, you know, the currency appreciation that was that happened during the uh, preceding the taper tantrum. Uh, if I recall correctly, uh, there was kind of a mistaken belief, perhaps, or a what would you call it? Uh, a wish or a, a mistaken belief, perhaps, that if you had a strong currency, that was good. Uh, and that, that went all the way up to the top leadership. So the, in, uh, the question is kind of a, how independent was the central bank in, uh, in, their, in the way they acted uh, in terms of the allowing the, uh, not, you know, intervening so that the currency would strong, look strong, be strong, when actually they should have allowed it to depreciate more. How much of that was a was a political economy issue as well, uh, given the the um, outlook on, of the perhaps the the government. Yeah, yeah. central bank is supposed to be independent, but government also uh, is there. Uh, and on the and interest rate is the same question actually. You know, how, uh, how much of it uh, the, the reluctance to raise the interest rate because of the uh, fear that it's going to have some reaction. Uh, from banks, from domestic uh, players, and so on. Um, the other thing I wanted to ask also was, um, uh, I think another lesson learned is how you announce policies, you know, all the way from Bernanke, who you just explained, and actually he didn't really, he was not prepared in uh, answering the question that was posed to him in Congress, and what he said had a huge impact, right? Uh, so central bank governors and ministers of finance have to be very careful in what they say. And, and it can also explain, it's not just the Bernan case of the world, and if you look at the Fed, it's probably somebody's already been doing this analysis, what from the first time he said it, and then they kept on uh, trying to say it, but they didn't actually do it. And then until the time when they kept on saying, okay, we want, we'll do it when the unemployment is uh, uh, lower and when the inflation is lower. And they just kept on having parameters, and people kept on predicting it. And I remember a conversation I had with Reza actually uh, in 2015. So when you talk about the 2015 story, besides the, the maybe the lack of policy reform and so on, I think it was you who told me uh, Thailand did better than us because they were able to explain the situation better than us. 
Yeah. So the messenger is very important in the way it influences market, especially when the market has incomplete information, doesn't have any clue uh, about too much about Indonesia and so on. So the way you uh, announce things and, and explain things become very important. I think that to me that's another important uh, lesson learned. It's that credibility uh, point that uh, uh, Ani was making uh, earlier. Um, the other thing I would say is that. Uh, what can we say about bad times and into good policies? Uh, I, I think I remember when we were talking about this in 2013, you said this exactly to me. And, and at the time, I was no longer where I, I could have had some influence on trade policy. But you said, don't worry about I'm, I'm trying to do bad times leading to good policies by undertaking the reforms. So the reforms that were undertaken were not just because of the inflation issue, but it was supposed to be a signal uh, to show that you know we are undertaking the economic reforms that will lead to a better basis for growth uh, and so on, right? So that I think is the credibility point that uh, Baani was making earlier, and I actually recall that that you tried to do investment reforms as well, but I'm not sure they 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 went down well or not, and I just wondered whether you want to share. Uh, whether you know what was the situation then that uh, made it more or less difficult for us to be able to announce the, the right policy reforms and I think in 2015 why India did better the perception that um, India at the time anyway was uh, actually uh, doing more reforms than Indonesia so it would be interesting to ask the question today now uh, we are facing again a normalization of the interest rate uh, how does India and Indonesia uh, compare uh, the last thing I would ask uh, is about global cooperation. I think, uh, what can we say about the importance of global cooperation? Uh, you did mention about the importance of that Belarus swap, and you mentioned uh, asking Bernanke at the G20 meeting. You know, you should when you talk, you should <laughs> think about the impact on, on us. And the answer was, get your whole, own house in order. <laughs> That's not kind of a, not an encouraging uh, answer for the, the issue of policy coordination. So the question is more about what is the role of G20 in policy coordination or AMRO or uh, IMF surveillance or whatever it is. Because if you think about it, that was kind of, maybe Bernanke answered in that way uh, because he felt that maybe everybody was ganging up on him at the time <laughs> because of what happened. It was a huge impact that he did not expect because it, it was not normal time. But he should think about it. If, you, if what they did actually created a lot of global volatility, going to come back and hit the US again, right? So policy coordination is still important. And uh, it's not just the way you say it, it's what you do, and how you do it in a considered way, uh, the timing and so on. And the issue again, uh, we keep on asking this question ever since the Asian financial crisis about the financial safety net, right? A bilateral swap, financial safety net, how important, how relevant is that to be able to be a shock absorber uh, in, in kind of the volatility that we expect probably will increase rather than decrease. Okay, that, I think I exactly 15 minutes, right? Yes, thank, thank you. you very much. <laughs> uh, we were actually uh, 13 minutes. Uh, <laughs> 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 okay, uh, there are really uh, tough questions from the lectures, yeah? from, from the teachers of the Dr. Kofi Basri. But uh, before Dr. Kofi Basri respond to them, uh, uh, we need to hear more theoretical uh, perspective, as Gumari mentions, from uh, Dr. Reza Siregar. Uh, the floor is yours, Mark. 15 minutes. Okay. Uh, let me start by thanking the organizer for having me here. Um, <clears throat> again, I, 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 honestly, after the three senior policymaker, I, I don't have anything to say. Um, and but I'm here, and you get stuck with me. Uh, <laughs> so I'll do my best to make your life as painless as possible for the next 15 minutes. Um, okay. right, um, I'm just going to pick up two things uh, that has been mentioned by the paper. And again, uh, I'm not going to uh, go through the paper as details because I think uh, the presentation has been well uh, elaborated. I'm just going to go back slightly on the domestic fundamentals uh, and also then looking at the second issue 
which is basically credibility of policy. And I think these are the two things that, uh, if anything, my accidental experience at Goldman Sachs teach me in terms of what market look at you, uh, in terms of uh, how you deal with your uh, economy and how they judge your economy. One is really your fundamentals, and secondly is basically where do you think you are in terms of your policy, in terms of your credibility, and also in terms of the space, the flexibility that uh, Ibu Minister actually just mentioned this morning. Um, so let me start with the first one. Uh, Ibu Ani mentioned about 500 billion uh, money came into our part of the world uh, uh, pre uh, during the QE after 2009. Uh, this is some of the some of that money. This is from the retail side of the uh, of that money. So we have about 200 billion from the retail side and institutional investor about the same amount. Uh, but within the windows of three months, the money that has been accumulated over the period of four years actually dwindled down by almost 80 billion just within the windows of three six months. Okay, so that was happening during the Fed taper tantrum. Um, and as 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 the the presentation of the idea illustrated. Uh, the first impact was really the extinction. Uh, we have seen rupiah to significantly depreciated, and also the Indian rupee. In fact, this is basically the story of our uh, currency in this part of the world. But what what I think uh, the message of the paper is that we were not doing too bad in this part of the world. Uh, I think compared to the emerging market of the Eastern Europe, uh, Latin America, if you look at the real number, the real sector number, for instance, uh, private credit uh, extension continues to be growing quite, quite decent in the case of Indonesia. Uh, in the case of India, also pre and post uh, tapering. Uh, in fact, we don't, you do not see for most of these countries in this part of the world the evidence that 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 that, that, that the the exchange of, uh, impacts or the, the pull out of capital is actually affecting the banking system lending activities. And also what we have seen, again I'm just going through the, some evidence, uh, why this is the case, uh, why we think that the financial market at least uh, uh, has been, uh, the impact has been quite limited to us. Um, they just mentioned a number of things. Uh, one of the things that I thought was also interesting is that the fact that our market is not that open in terms of the financial deepening, right? I mean, if you look at the size of the external financings to the banking system as percentage of GDP, uh, Indonesia, Philippines, and India were among the lowest. So in that sense, we are quite fortunate that to begin with, we were not ex exposed uh, to the financial market compared to, let's say, Malaysia, uh, and of course, the financial market like Singapore, Japan, Hong Kong, and so on. Uh, so we are somewhat isolated from that, right? I think this is one thing that, that, that we have seen. Uh, another thing also that mentioned quite heavily by uh, the paper uh, is the role of the link between current account and, 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 and financial expansion in this part of the world. Uh, I think uh, the paper writer actually highlighted a quite important point within the links of uh, current account to saving and investment. Right. So despite of the fact that we have a credit expansion that's quite rapid, uh, the story of uh, commodity price helped cushion Indonesia. Uh, so we were able to finance that current account, uh, that, that expansion uh, in, the, in, in, the, in the loans without having much of deterioration in current account, at least to the point where uh, 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 that we have seen basically in, 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 in the last few years. Now it's slightly different case of India. India actually have much worse uh, level of current account deficit, but credit expansion in India was somewhat muted, or at least less uh, expensive than Indonesia. And one of the reasons is that India was actually in the cycle of uh, uh, economic slowdown. India was facing higher non-performing loans, so India was actually reforming or taking initiative to tighten the economy to ensure financial stability well before uh, Indonesia, because given the fact of the domestic financial market was 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 really a was not in order at that time. So uh, the level of credit expansion was in India was actually just slightly higher than the, the average that they have been doing, uh, despite of the fact the current account deficit was, was quite high. Now another thing that was interesting about India is that to support the balance of payment and reserve, uh, they open up channel where they sell bonds or uh, debts to non-resident Indians. So this basically brings around 15 to 16 billion US dollars 
uh, to India to support the foreign exchange reserve and also support the extension itself. So this is something that uh, a unique case of India where they take advantage of the, the massive uh, 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 capacity of Indian outside to bring money home by selling government bonds. Um, so that's the fundamentals. I think this is something that well said and, and, and elaborated in, 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 uh, in the paper by, uh, by our paper writers. Uh, but one thing that I want to share with you is basically a bit of why my, my take, or at least my experience in the last two and a half years when I was working at Goldman Sachs, is that uh, market really look at the credibility and the space and the flexibility of your policies. Uh, when we look at one thing that I have to do as, as someone responsible for Southeast Asian economy and the world is basically to see how much fiscal space that this country has. What is, is that a credible policy? And also the same thing also monetary policy. And this is something again, will highlight also the challenge going forward uh, for India and Indonesia. And I think that they uh, mentioned this also uh, toward the end. Now, if you look at the fiscal, there's similarity between Indonesia and, and India. On the revenue side, India is actually doing better than us. General government of India, in terms of the tax revenue, is about 15 to 17 percent of GDP. Us is about 10 to 11 percent at this stage still. Right? Um, but both of them actually depending heavily on tax revenues. Uh, 80 to 90 percent of our revenues are still coming from tax. So tax collection is still going to be a big issue for both countries if they want to be able to. To, uh, uh, to to have a uh, effective fiscal policy. The issue here is this. How do you have a case where fiscal policy can be counter-cyclical? Right? So the idea is that you want to have a situation where fiscal has enough space and flexibility to be counter-cyclical when it is needed. Uh, typically, fiscal is a lot more pro-cyclical or tendency to be pro-cyclical. Now, that, this is the one that, that, that actually highlighted quite vividly by, by the paper, is that the difference between Indonesia and India, unfortunately, is that India is importer of oil, importer of the commodity, the key commodities, and Indonesia is actually exporters. And our revenues depend heavily, like in the case of Malaysia, our revenues depend also on commodities. And so the issue is that we have a, a good a swing of uh, commodities in 2010, 2011, 2012, but that story may not exist at this point. There was some hope that there was going to be some recovery in commodity price, but I think the issue is actually not as convincing in recent months, especially with commodities, red food oil actually falling below 50 again. So this is a big challenge that we face. Revenues in India benefited, uh, I mean revenue in Indonesia does not benefit from the fall in oil price, uh, but at the same time, India is not really affected by, by not much by commodities. <coughs> And expenditure sector, there's a lot of similarity. If you look at the breakdowns of our budget, right, really hardly any space for any flexibility in our budget. And I think this is true also for India. What I'm trying to say is this. To be flexible, we need to have at least a good space for non-discretionary spending. Right? But if you look at our composition, most of our composition, our budget is actually mandatory spending. There's very little space left, even for general government, central government spending, to be able to, 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 to stimulate the economy. And these are the issues that, that, that we face, and also in the case of India as well. Uh, and that also explains why we have not been able to really boost consistently significant capital spending. Uh, again, I think flexibility is an issue. Now, I just want to throw in this uh, to the table, and especially I think this is something that maybe uh, the paper can also question this. Uh, how do we do with this fiscal law? Should we, I hate to say this, but should we stick with this 3% budget deficit rule? In Singapore, for instance, we have a budget deficit rule over the cycle of five years. They have to have a budget balance over the, the, the cycle of five years. So the idea is that during the time of difficulty, they may be able to have a deficit, but as well as over the whole five years of government, they have a budget balance. So the question now is that should we actually have open up a bit of this flexibility in order to be able to have a counter cyclical fiscal measure. Okay, so that's on the fiscal side. When I came into Goldman, it was in the late 2014, people were excited about Jokowi. People were excited about infrastructure, right? Uh, but again, the issues that, so, so we, when I was there, one of the first things that I did at Goldman is basically to study 
the experience of countries that have done infrastructure spending in the last uh, uh, 60 years, actually. Uh, there, there is a, a database from the IMF is actually able to <coughs> separate the public spending and the private spending. The lesson I learned is that A, yes, infrastructure public spending will have an impact positively on growth, but B, it takes to 24 months to 36 months of convincing capital increase in the spending of public persistently over the next three, uh, two to three years before meaningful capital expenditure but from the private sector and you start to pick up. But it meant basically, unless you convince the private sector to put money uh, in your system, and it takes about two, three years of an increase, a persistent, robust increase in your capital spending publicly, you will not be able to see that. Now, it is a challenge for Indonesia because if you look at the relationship between FDI and gross fixed capital formation, it is clearly quite uh, strong. In fact, 60 to 70 percent of our gross fixed capital formation is actually explained by the violation of FDI. So not only we have to convince that we are serious about public infrastructure, but we also have to convince foreign investor, not domestic investor, because we just don't simply have enough liquidity in the system. So this is why fiscal is critical. And, and I think the windows in the market is actually running out, because again, unless we have that process uh, this is already 2017. Uh, Jokowi came in 2014. Again, uh, uh, this is uh, this is uh, running against the time as well. Monetary policy, regaining credibility, I think that's quite critical. And I think I agree with some of the issues that that mentioned by paper writer and also by Mary in terms of credibility of monetary policy. Before 2007, if you look at this, uh, this is actually a borrow from the Economist magazines. Uh, John Taylor used his tool, Taylor rule to basically to the fact, look, you are actually uh, should have increased your policy rate. You are, you are, the Taylor rule is actually much higher than the actual policy rate, meaning that you've been easing too long, right? And there's been a lot of debate on this one, well before the Taper time frame. But obviously the statement in 2013 really brought home that issues, and that's why it is actually becoming a concern. Is it the time now? Because they've been talking about the fact that that the U.S. Fed is maybe too long. So when I get, when I was at Goldman again, I look at what happens to the policy of my central bank, which is basically the uh, fourth Southeast Asian central bank. Uh, Banco uh, Central of Filipina, Bank of Thailand, Bank of Malaysia, and Bank of Indonesia. So I look at every single monetary policy decision for this central bank. For Indonesia, for instance, every month from 2009 to, I think this paper was published around mid-2015. So I look at how many times that they were surprising the market, meaning that they make something against market consensus. So what I found is that in the case of Thailand, for instance, 60 percent, 16 percent, sorry, of that time, Philippines is the least about five percent, Bank Indonesia was about 17 percent. So meaning that market was expecting something, Bank Indonesia did something else. Okay. Now I'm not saying that the market is right, but I'm saying is that uh, you know, and then I'm trying to ex to understand why they did that and how do they explain that okay but it is clear to me that the 2009 period all the way until 2015 was very difficult and again you know to be fair you have commodity uh, you have issue of china we have brexit we have many things that is actually was on the table at that time but it was very confusing basically from the market perspective to understand what's going on with our central bank in fact sometimes we worry whether it is the central bank that provides guidance to the market, or it is market that providing guidance to the central bank to do what they should do. Uh, so, have go, gaining that confidence back is critical, and I think this is what I agree with, uh, with with the discussion this morning, including Barani, is that communication is critical. Um, but we do have a space now, I think at least, hopefully, uh, commodity may not be recovering. But commodity has become more or less a little bit more stable than what we see in late 2014, 2015. Uh, that should actually reduce the space also for high inflation in the system, and therefore that provides support to our monetary policy space. Current account has improved, and they, they actually mentioned it quite critically how current account actually help all stage country that have a high current account deficit, special monetary policy. I think the, the improvement in current account should actually reduce. Uh, and it should actually open up a bit of flexibility in the uh, monetary policy. So I think that we have that uh, coming against uh, for us. 
But the challenge that we face again, are we facing the same problems that we had pre-2007? Globally, we have uh, inflation that is moderating. In fact, we have a great moderation period, right? Output gap, you think about output, economy was actually growing at potential output gap, or at least close to potential output globally, right? So, so monetary policy, if you just follow a simple Taylor rule, just looking at inflation gap and output gap, and ignore the financial stability issue. Because the challenge right now is basically, our output is actually growing slower. There's a concern that we are actually performing below our potential output. Although inflation is actually still quite uh, uh, moderate, but yet our asset market is actually picking up. So how do we explain an asset market, for instance, stock exchange that continuously breaking new ground, new level of highs, without much of fundamental support? In the case of the U.S., Dow Jones is actually hitting over 21,000 now, right? And much of it is basically explained by contribution of the financial sector indices. And financial sector, the banking system is basically expecting tax, right, tax cut in the in the U.S. and also loosening of the uh, loosening of banking regulations in the U.S. The question is that is that going to come? If it's not going to come, then are we going to see a bit of corrections on that? So that financial stability is going to be an issue again facing us. Again, at least in terms of market consensus forecast, there's some correction in terms of GDP. The number on the left hand side is basically looking at, when you look at negative, is basically, if I look at market consensus, there seems to be in the last five years continued correction in terms of lowering the growth rate outlook, lowering the potential growth outlook for these countries. Right? So in the left hand side, we saw that. But on the right hand side, the asset market continues to grow. So there's, there's, there's again this connection between output gap headline inflation, and financial stability, asset market. How do we deal with this? How do, what kind of policy mix should we deal with this? How does the monetary policy deal with this? And I think this is the, this still the challenge that we faced in pre-2007 and we are facing it now as well. One thing also common about India and Indonesia is the fact that, again, the financial openness compared to some of this economy are, are not as open as deep as well. So in, 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 in the hindsight, 2013 tapering actually, this situation helped us uh, uh, insulate the economy from the global financial volatility. But one thing we learned also is that the lack of dampness in our financial market creates a lot of volatility. Just a small shock, small news in the market, given that our market is not deep, it actually creates a lot of volatilities. So volatilities, trans uh, the transmission of global volatility into our domestic market is actually quite high, despite of our financial market dampness. One final uh, thing that I think David is also has mentioned is that pre-tapering, India sovereign bonds less than 3% is actually held by foreign investor. We have over 30%. Now we are closing to about 40%. So I think this is again something that we, we may be, uh, uh, we need to be mindful about in terms of the potential reversal should we have another, another round of shocks uh, coming up from the global financial market. So let me stop there and thank you very much. Yeah, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Reyes. Uh, okay, uh, we already have uh, two uh, inputs from insights from the, the prominent uh, discussions. And I will give Pak uh, Kotik Basri uh, to respond uh, very briefly before I open a question and answer uh, session. Pak Kotik Basri, please. Thank you very much, uh, Kiki. Uh, Ibu Mary, the way you ask the question, it's really like uh, well, my teacher because because your questions really help me to, to to put this this paper into a better shape. It's also comment by by Reza. So your all your points are well taken. So let me address some issue that is probably uh, important to be shared for the lesson learned about uh, the policy because Ibu Mary asking about especially about the political economy. So let me let me share the political economy story with this. <clears throat> I didn't, I did not try um, the, this issue uh, in, in a sort of like in quite deep in this paper, yeah, because I thought I was thinking to focus only on the, on the policy response, but maybe I have to need to, to, to include the political economy story. Uh, your question, uh, your comment regarding the importance of policy coordination. Yes, it is very important. 
and this is related to your question as well about this bad times makes good policy. The reality is far from you know not easy as what we thought on the process because uh, at that time uh, both government and the central bank, at least the MOF and also the central bank, we agree that the first one is we need to decide what is our our policy objective, and we decided at that time is stability over growth. Yeah, we decided the stability over growth. It means that the government will support the uh, more uh, tight uh, economic policy, both on the fiscal and also on the monetary side, in order to stabilize the economic growth. That's the, the most important. We had uh, several meetings between the MOF and the central bank, and we decided that we have to put stability over growth. The next question is how to communicate this to the politician. Because this is very tough. It happened only nine months before the election. Yeah. And and I think this is this happened already about four years ago, so probably it's about time for me to, to share the story <laughs> to all of you. The process was not easy, not easy at all. Yeah, but the thing uh, that we did at that time, we tried to convince the politician, the leaders. Uh, all the people at the time, that if we do not take this stern action, the economic situation will continue to deteriorate. And my last punchline at the time, it is true that nine months after this we will have an election, but I'm worried if we don't, if we do nothing, we won't have an election next year because we will be in crisis. Yeah. So this really put the bad times makes good policy. The second one is how to convince, this is exactly your question, uh, Mary, how to convince the leader to accept the weak currency? Because for many leaders, maybe in, uh, including the current administration, believe that the strong currency is politically good. It reflects that the confidence is there. But actually what happened in 2013, was the overvaluation of the rupiah? The rupiah was was you know too strong. It is exactly explained by Reza in his in his chart about the monetary policy. You know the, the divergence between monetary policy expectation and monetary policy. Um, so at that time, uh, Bumari, what we did, we sort of like we provide a trajectory path. Our argument at that time was the quantitative easing period is an abnormal world. The normal world is the world pre the QE. And look at the rupiah pre the QE. It was around 12,000. So what happened after the QE, the rupiah appreciated to around 8,000, almost 9,000. So what we need to do is to bring back the exchange rate back to the normal situation, which is pre-QE. Yeah? In order to do that, we have to let the exchange rate to depreciate. Fortunately, we have you. <laughs> At that time, and we have Pabudiono as a strong anchor to understand about this macroeconomic policy, get a strong support of this. Yeah, and then the second one is to convince the leader at that time to support Bank Indonesia for raising the interest rate. Yeah, because raising the interest rate means slowing down the growth, which is, of course, as a leader, uh, every leader in the world doesn't want to see their economic growth slowing down nine months before the election. Yeah, but we said that we need to do this kind of policy. We need to support the Bank Indonesia, but Bank Indonesia is relatively is not relatively is independent actually. So what we could do is actually to give a strong support to Bank Indonesia that they don't need to worry about the government support. So at that time, what uh, I did, I called Pak Agus and I said that let me worry about the government side. You just do it your monetary policy side. Let me try to convince leader. And we had a two and a half hour meeting with the president at the time until Pak SBY eventually agreed. And he said that, I leave it to you. And immediately I called Pak Agus and I said, the government will back any policy made by the central bank. And few days after that, the Bank Indonesia start to raise the interest rate 50 basis point, 50 basis point, 50 basis point. But the government need to do their homework to, to ensure that stability over growth is uh, uh, very important. The other thing, uh, Bumeri, is about communication. 
this is very difficult because we have to distinguish the way we communicate with the uh, public to the market to journalists what we did at the time every two other weeks after the friday prayer i made a small class at the mof which is the participant are journalists so i explained to them like like what i did in the class the saving investment gap that's what why we need to do this kind of thing to sort of really love basic principles about this eco 101 about the policy and i said that if this happened this should be expected because uh, slowing down of the economy is by design. You don't need to worry about it. To the market, we conduct conference call almost every two weeks. And we said that you would expect this would happen. Yeah. To the policymaker, we continue to sort of like to work with this. And that's explained. This is the thing that I like from this story. Not many people realize that 2013, the rupiah was depreciated by almost 20%. But not much panic at the time. In fact, in 2015, when you said Reza, the rupiah was only depreciated by less than 10%, but creates a panic at the time. So the issue of this communication, it shows that a very important issue. Yeah. You have to manage you know, your, your, your stakeholders, you need to talk to the market, you have to convince your bondholders, you need to use your, your uh, uh, network, even that, uh, let me tell you a secret. Uh, I asked Nouriel Rubini to write an op-ed about Indonesia, you know, the positive side, this was a story about Indonesia at that time. Because, <laughs> because, because if this, this uh, message comes from the government, nobody believes us. They should ask someone else to, and of course Nouriel is a doctor do, you know, he always keep a very pessimistic uh, view, but on Indonesia he was very optimistic at that time. So we, 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 we ask his, his support as well. Um, about this global policy, I don't have the answer for this, Ibu Mary, but uh, I think based on our experience, it is important to have at least, there are two uh, possibilities of this international coordination. The hardcore one, we do the concerted effort together, fiscal and monetary, it is in my view, is not possible. The second one is the soft core. We exchange some policy during the G20. So in my view, G20 is probably the good forum to exchange view, to share its other experience. The implication is, after Benanki, I think Janet Yellen improved the communication. Yeah, they, they have a better communication now. Yeah, what uh, Yellen did in the G20 meeting, she gave a presentation. He gave a sort of like trajectory, the possibility, you know, 70% of the member of the uh, Reserve Bank saying that there is a need to adjust the interest rate. 15%, so he, she just gave this probability, which is really give us a sort of like an insight, what kind of policy that we need to anticipate. I think the way uh, Yellen communicates is much better than Bernanke. And even if you recall, when uh, China devalued their currency, uh, the Fed decided not to raise the interest rate at the time to consider China, which is the opposite of what um, uh, Bernanke, uh, Bernanke did. Uh, let me respond to Reza's question. Just one question. I think uh, I, I completely agree with your comments. But your question about this fiscal space, whether we should abandon this 3%, I, uh, I would say that I would agree with you if you can ensure that this government could be uh, immune for the political intervention. In the sense that once you abandon this 3%, that everyone will come to you to ask for uh, more fiscal or government uh, program, whereas every program always can be justified. In my view, with, by putting the 3%, this will push the government to, be, to become more efficient. Because even until today, a lot of issues related to the quality of spending. Yeah? Even the government is not able to absorb the 3%, basically. So, so from my perspective, probably it's better for us to maintain the 3% rather than giving too much room for the politician to abuse the fiscal deficit. Yeah. So I think... this one. Okay, sure. The, the, the issue is uh, maybe not <coughs> abounding the 3% there, but 
make it into a cycle of five years instead of on an annual basis that we have to have that three percent. So maybe this year you can have a three point five percent deficit. As long as tomorrow we have two point five, the average is about three percent. So looking at the whole cycle of five years of the government instead of annual basis. Thank you, Dr. Reza. Thank you, Pakati uh, Basri, for uh, response to the questions. Now I open uh, question and answer sessions. Uh, uh, to my watch, we have around uh, 25 minutes. I open. I, I think I may open uh, three uh, questions. One, Dr. Fabrio. Another two. Left hand side, right hand side, please. Okay, Dr. Fabrio, please ask the questions. And uh, please mention your name yes. and affiliation. Uh, my name is Fabrio Kasaribu. I'm head of research for macro and trade uh, at LPM. So Kiki, basically my boss. So, <laughs> <busy> boss. <laughs> And uh, uh, thank you very much. This is a very um, a special moment, special occasion for us. Um, I learned a lot from uh, all of these distinguished speakers. I enjoyed. Uh, you were our professors, our uh, our lecturers when we were still students. Me and Kiki, we actually just one one year apart, so uh, we were really your students, and we learned a lot from you guys. Uh, uh, continually, even till today. <laughs> so thank you very much. Uh, we appreciate it. Um, my question is, um, uh, I think about um, uh, when, when we talk about monetary policy, we talk about m transmission of mechanism, right? Now, my question is going to be the reverse of that. So we are always afraid of um, uh, hot money coming into our uh, financial system, right? Now, um, and, and always there is a dichotomy in our thought, at least the way we speak about it, between uh, short-term capital inflows uh, with foreign direct investment. As if uh, that these, these, the sources of these two monies, type of monies, will be different type of investors. Well, I think we might be mistaken on that, because what happened is, when hot money coming in, they usually um, uh, respond to incentives, clearly. But the incentives will be coming from, clearly, from the financial market first. And as for money coming into Indonesia, they will go to government bonds first here, or to stock market. That's why we have 40% of our government bonds now owned by foreigners, and now we have 60% of stocks now owned by uh, foreigners. Which is not too bad, comparatively, uh, in terms of if we think about it as uh, market confidence towards our economy. But the problem is, we always fear that to be um, uh, something that's going to be hazard. Uh, as soon as there is a uh, global financial crisis, or uh, at least there is a shock in the global financial market, we're going to be uh, uh, thinking about how to uh, curb uh, the impact to our economy, right? Now. I think what, 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 what the problem is, uh, just uh, Parez also mentioned just now, was um, our market is too shallow, and we don't have enough uh, channels uh, for this money coming in uh, to be transmissioned into real sector, right? So this, this is what I mean by reverse transmission me mechanism. So we, first of all, we need to learn how quickly they come uh, uh, in terms of hot money. And not only that, we need to learn how quickly they become uh, to, to, to convert to become uh, deposits in the commercial banks, right? And there will be transmission how uh, the, the yield government bonds will actually uh, follow on by uh, loan, uh, uh, loan uh, rate. Um, from the data, we can see that that from 2000, uh, during the tape tantrum, before the tape tantrum, we have uh, billions of US dollars coming into our market. And then, not long after that, it was followed by increase in foreign direct investment. At least we can see that from the bank loan to increase by about 30% per year, uh, or around 20% per year, and then slowing down to now, we have a very pro-cyclical uh, 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 growth of loan uh, with the, the GDP growth rate, right? So my question is, do we understand, how much do we understand really uh, the, the reverse of transmission of mechanism from the financial sector back to the real sector? How, how fast how, how, how fast is it right now maybe also we need uh, to, to to provide more of channels of uh, in between real sector and financial sector 
uh, I was I was thinking about the tax amnesty problem that we just finished, and we had about a hundred trillion, several trillion, hundred trillion US, uh, rupiah coming in. But we know, I mean, based on several uh, person, of course, but there are actually hundreds of billions of US dollars money parked in uh, Singapore, the closest to us, actually owned by Indonesia. So when we talk about their investment, of course, we're not talking about nationality here. We're actually talking about simply about nationality of the money, right? We invite them to come. So when we talk about that tax amnesty problem, several uh, people have been uh, analyzing this and we say, oh, maybe if we had more of uh, types of investment. Dr. Fabry, um, can you make it shorter? Oh, excuse me, yes. <laughs> if, if we could have, for example, uh, 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 in the context of uh, infrastructure projects as well, um, I, I'm, I, I remember I, I've been bothering uh, Bangladesh with these questions in the last several months about the infrastructure bonds, etc. Maybe we could have channeled those money much better and to make the market uh, not as shallow. So something like that. So we, we're not going to be so afraid of uh, global financial shock and we will be trying to uh, you know, do something just to avoid that. But why don't we try to uh, take advantage of that capital inflow with uh, getting our market more ready for that? Excuse me for taking the next time. No, Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Fabrio. You know, uh, lectures. Yeah. Maybe ask the questions. They also have uh, pic figures, pictures, and all diagrams in mind and that they need to be delivered. OK, uh, I can open an another two questions, uh, but uh, please be uh, straightforward. And please mention your name and affiliation before you pass a question. Uh, any other two questions? Okay, one from this side. Okay, please go. Thank you. Thank you, Fadede, Ibumani, Bureza, for very, uh, Mareza, for a very interesting uh, session. Um, I have a couple of questions just linking to the fiscal story one. I mean, uh, I, 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 I'm sharing with you that I think there's a need for looking at a fiscal more in the medium term rather than sort of like annual. And we see that also in terms of the, the issue of how government spends money. I mean, the current administration really improved when I mean, we just, you know, looking at the last quarter, I and mean, the spending is actually improved in terms of, you know, reducing subsidy, bit further, and, and so on and so on. But we still have the challenge of how to, to, to plan in the medium term, because if you look at the short term, you know, you kind of like have the, the, the issues of, you know, uh, whether your spending is actually effective, whether you're actually managing your risk in the medium term, and things like that. So I think, I hope we can continue this discussion to actually make things uh, concrete uh, on the ground to actually improve the, 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 the things in the medium term. My second uh, uh, is a question on this, this uh, financial sector issue. Like, everybody knows that we need to deepen the financial sector, and the challenge is always uh, how would you do that? Uh, I mean, there's uh, several uh, thinking uh, or, or ideas uh, around that, but I, I would like to bring also a, 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 a uh, a comment that we see from the again the government role in, in financing the, 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 the their gap is somehow it's calling out the private sector it's sort of like uh, uh, and then again the people to actually the financial uh, uh, sector so are you in that uh, sort of like same view and if you think that's the case how do the, the current administration need to, to uh, improve that thank you Thank you. Uh, I can open one plus given the time. Any? Yeah. Uh, yeah, thank you, Budi Sajdarmo. And you, Hati uh, Basri, uh, you have been mentioning uh, that India and Indonesia can um, come up with, uh, from the temper tantrum, but uh, why India come up much better than Indonesia? Uh, to uh, give some description of why it is happening. Thank you. Thank you very much, Babudi. So, uh, you have, I think, um, seven minutes to respond to all the questions. <laughs> is, it, is it worth it? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Uh, Fabrio, I, I completely agree about the framework first, that you should channel this uh, capital inflow into the real sector. Yeah, because as we know, if this money stay in the, in the in the financial sector without the government or the private sector uh, are not able to channel it to uh, the real sector, it might create a bubble. But the difficult part is uh, how to make it happen. Yeah, 
and this is related to uh, their last question as well. Um, I agree that one of the key issues related to the issue of infrastructure, because you mentioned specifically about infrastructure, is about financing. But to me, this is a secondary issue, because the most difficult part is on the implementation on the ground. The first issue is uh, related to the land clearing. Yeah, I'm, I'm fortunately, I'm, I'm involved on the on the company uh, uh, related to the infrastructure now, we and the company, we are looking for project, but not many good projects available. Many people come by saying that we have this infrastructure project, but not a good one, in the sense that, you know, it's not uh, commercially viable, uh, the regulation is still not complete yet, so basically it's not really a good project. Only a few projects available related to that. And that's explained why it is very difficult to channel this money from the financial sector into the real sector. Uh, let me give an example about this land clearing. One particular power plant project, it took us more than 10 years to get this land clearing to happen. Yeah. So I think without doing something related to the uh, issue of this land clearing, we, lucky we already have this eminent domain law has been passed about three years ago and fully enacted now so i would expect a better situation but still a big problem even if you're talking about this mrt yeah the second phase will face a challenge related to the issue of the land clearing yeah so money to me is secondary because once the opportunity is there a lot of people will come to invest especially on the infrastructure uh, sectors so I completely agree with you, but the question is uh, how we make sure um, that the opportunity is there, especially on infrastructure projects. Most of the infrastructure projects now focus only on uh, two sectors, road and power plant. Uh, do you know the reason why? Because on those two sectors, the government regulation already completed, but not in other sectors. That's the question from Fabrio. Uh, on Dela, uh, your, your, your comment is, is very similar to Reza's comment. My concern related to this is, uh, to, the, to your question is like this. Yeah. If you larger the fiscal deficit, yeah, if you larger the fiscal deficit, let's go beyond 3%. Even if you're talking about medium, maybe, you know, if, if not by year, probably about the, the medium term, we have to look at this issue uh, carefully. But let's say if you larger the fiscal deficit, you probably need to look at the loan to deposit ratio now. Our loan to deposit ratio is about 90%. If the loan go faster than the deposit, the LDR will go probably about 100% will make banking sector become vulnerable. So it means that the capacity of banking sector to expand will be as fast as the growth of the third party fund. So if you larger the fiscal deficit, then you will withdraw the money yeah, from the banking sector into the government bonds. This will tighten the liquidity and your concern about this cutting out, which is actually happening now. The reason why we have this a very shallow um, a bond market is because the liquidity issue. That is why we need the foreign investor, the foreign holders on the, on the bond market. So I think, uh, I'm not talking about the number, we really need to look at this, whether we need to expand the fiscal deficit as much as what we want, but we need to be very careful with the crowding out. That's the first one. The second one is about effectiveness. I hate to say this, but I think the subsidy is back now. <laughs> because with the oil prices about $55, last year about, about 40 by now the government should adjust the fuel price by at least 15 to 20%. The government decided not to raise the price for electricity 450 so probably we have a subsidy about 50 trillion nowadays the subsidy is back if you're looking from this perspective a lot of room actually to improve rather than increase the budget deficit yeah and the quality of spending if you want to have a um, uh, significant impact on the growth just spend the money on the area which have the marginal propensity to consume is very high whereas the poor people but my concern 
not to criticize the government. If you provide the non-cash support for the raskin, the cheap rice, then the question is whether this cheap rice will be available in every outlet all over Indonesia. If not, you spend your money, but basically no consumption. Because with the non tonight, you have to go to every warung, and every warung has to have this card reader. So we have to make sure that Bullock can supply this. Without that, you look at the Dana Desa. We spend about 60 trillion, 70 trillion money, what will be the impact? Yeah, so again, you know, um, I think I'm still in the, in the position to look at, probably do the some efficiency on the government spending, rather than to increase the, the, the threshold for the budget. Um, Woody, your uh, question, uh, I, 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 I explain a little bit, but basically the first reason is because the terms of trade effect, because India benefited from the uh, declining commodity prices. The second one, uh, it, because <coughs> India benefited from this declining commodity prices, their current account deficit also improved much faster than us. So give much room for the Reserve Bank of India to lower the interest rate, which is push the economic growth. Uh, much faster. The third reason is because the reform in India, I think in terms of opening up the foreign investment, this is related to uh, Mary's question, is much more significant than that. Uh, we did try at that time, but Mary, especially to revise the, uh, the negative list, but I would say the, the result was very nominal. Yeah. Uh, we didn't do much our homework related to the opening up the foreign uh, investment. Indeed, that did a significant reform, especially on the banking sector. You open up, uh, you let the foreign ownership on the banking sector, on the services sector. That's what retail, yeah. uh, retail, yeah. and retail, yeah, and that's really helped the, the economy to improve. And most of the foreign direct investment in India went into services export, which is does not have, which is naturally has. In our case, most of the foreign direct investment went to the natural resources and domestic market. We did good in the short term, but later on, when they pay the uh, profit repatriation, there is a risk of the mis uh, currency mismatch. So the lesson learned is maybe in the future, even foreign direct investment, if possible, focus on the export-oriented sector, because this will be naturally heads. Yeah, if this foreign direct investment focus on domestic market or natural resources, there's always a risk on the capital account side on the balance of payment. So I hope I answer all these questions. Yeah. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Kati Basri. Uh, I commit to myself to not conclude this uh, discussion, <laughs> seminar. So uh, before I return back the power to the MC, uh, please join me to give a big round of applause to Dr. <laughs> discussants and participants for this very productive and engaging discussion. As we have reached the end of today's forum, we would like to invite the head of ANU Indonesia project, Bapak Budi Rasul Sudarmo, PhD, to deliver the closing remarks. Bapak Budi Rasul Sudarmo, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank First of all, I would like to thank uh, Dede, uh, Bumari, Reza, and Kiki for a uh, very nice uh, discussion today. And I would like also to thank all of you to participate. Uh, before I close down this session, I would like to mention to you several of our activities, Indonesia Project activities. We collaborate with various organizations in Indonesia to strengthen uh, policy debate in the country and hopefully will um, produce a better policy in the country. Uh, the upcoming uh, uh, activities uh, will be, uh, oops, so tomorrow we are going to have almost a similar format, uh, what we call Mubiarto Public Policy Forum, in, it will be in Jogja. 
Mubiarto uh, consists of uh, two uh, activity. One is the Mubiarto panel, and Pa Budiono is going to give a keynote in that panel. It will be about uh, inequality, and then it will we will have again another comparative uh, as, uh, a comparative analysis a session in which we invite uh, Basi again to uh, Yogyakarta. And and in uh, July 4th, uh, together with CSIS, we are conducting uh, Hadisus Astro Policy Forum, uh, in which it will consist of Hadisus Astro Lecture. Uh, Professor uh, Peter Dresdale will give the lecture. Uh, the title will be Why Indonesia Must Show the Way on Trade Strategy. And, and in that forum, we are also going to launch uh, Indonesia Update Book, uh, which is uh, the digital Indonesia. Uh, and then uh, in December, uh, we will have uh, the BS Economic Dialogue in, and, and Forum, in which we uh, bring uh, the author of a paper published this year to three cities in Indonesia. It will, oh, this, this, today, uh, this year will be to five cities in Indonesia. The first one will be in Bandung, and then after that we move to Bali, Palembang, Bogor, and uh, Matara. And the article that we choose for is written by Stephen Mark on non tariff trade regulation in Indonesia. Uh, we also collaborate with about probably 15 organizations in Jakarta and various cities to conduct a weekly seminar, what we call for Kajian. Pembangunan and this month uh, we collaborate with uh, LPM and Lembaga Demografi and these are the schedule for this month. Uh, I encourage you to uh, participate. And if you were in Canberra, uh, the Indonesia Update Conference this year in Canberra is about globalization, nationalism and sovereignty. Uh, Pak Arianto Patunru, uh, Bu Mari, dan Pak Hati Pasi uh, are the convener. Um, uh, some of the speakers are mentioned over here, but we got uh, much more speaker. And this uh, topic, we, are, we plan to also produce a book uh, on this topic next year. Of course, Indonesia project, although we are small, we got a lot of activities, we got research activities, uh, we do have a, a lot of dissemination activities and I encourage you to participate. You can participate in our research activity, but you could also participate in our dissemination activities. And you can follow our activities in various media. We are in Facebook, we are in YouTube, uh, we are also in Twitter. Uh, with that, um, I hope that um, you guys a uh, lot of benefit uh, from this uh, lecture and uh, hopefully to see you again next year in the 12th study lecture. Thank you. Thank you, Baba. And we would like to invite Baba Budiris of Sudarmo to give all the discussions and, uh, and the speakers uh, the token of appreciation. Thank you. Thank you.